upper room. Um, we are currently in a series called It Is Well With My Soul. And if you missed the kickoff message last week, I would encourage you to jump in uh, earlier in our YouTube channel. Check that out because last week really set the pace for everything um, in this series. So we'd love to have you hear that. This series is all about the, the rhythms of a healthy soul. Because I think 2020 has done a, a real number on many of our souls. And I think if where you're at is a place where you're not healthy, but you kind of look to the future and you go, oh, it'll be better down the road. Let me tell you something. If you don't change your direction, you're going to arrive exactly where you're going. If you remember the wisdom of the ancient Chinese fortune cookie I talked about last week. So what we want to do is currently assess where we're at and play that out and then make the necessary course adjustments because we all know this bad days make for bad months, make for bad years, make for bad decades. And so let's make the changes we need now. Let's fine tune it and say, look, are we at a place where our souls are healthy and in a sustainable rhythm? And if not, let's do something about that. Let's have good days and then, and then build them together. And I'm admittedly in this series, I'm just preaching to myself. I always am. I'm preaching to myself more than I'm preaching to anybody. So this isn't me like, hey, you people. This is, this is us, okay? So Mark 1, 9 says this. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. So, okay. Oh, wow, there's a lot going on. Angels, wild animals, Holy Spirit, doves, desert, heaven torn open. And I've always kind of had a hard time with trying to make sense of all this. So what's this all about? The baptism was great, and then he gets into the, the desert, the wilderness, and the devil's there. And then there's this kind of this, you must pass these three trials, right? Turning, turning rocks into bread, and jumping off stuff, and angels catching you, and bow down and worship me. I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. And I've always read it, and I've even heard it taught that this wilderness testing was like some sort of strenuous, grueling challenge. And if Jesus could make it through the 40 days, if he could <clears throat> succeed where the first Adam failed. That's what we kind of heard it, right? Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus is the one who would step into a desolate wilderness where Adam was in a perfect circumstance, a flourishing garden, trees full of fruit, everybody was happy, naked and unashamed. But even in that perfect situation, Adam fell. So Jesus was going to come to this, this anti-Eden, this desert wilderness, this bad land. And Jesus was unwilling to eat that forbidden fruit. Actually, it's forbidden carbs, which I would have had a hard time with that. Right? I'm going to be honest with you. Fruit, I could take it or leave it. To give me some hot bread, some olive oil, yes, please. So Jesus, like, turned down the carbs, all that. And how I've always seen it is, he's there in the wilderness and he sort of hates it. And it's horrible. And he's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And at the 40-day mark, he's so weak. And the devil shows up. And Jesus is barely hanging on, but he manages somehow to rally himself. He's emaciated and sick, but he still somehow prevailed. And that all presupposes what I believe might be a fallacy. That, and that is that Jesus did not like the wilderness. That he somehow objected to being there. And if that's the case, then the rest of the gospel accounts don't make much sense. Like, what are you going to do with Mark chapter 1, verse 35, which says, Very early in the morning. While it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place. Same idea as the original language, wilderness places, where he prayed. You have a little bit of time before the day begins, what are you going to do, Jesus? I want to be in the wilderness. Mornings, he would hang out there. We're also told in Matthew's Gospel, 14, verse 23, after he had sent them away. So this is talking about kind of the crowds that followed him. So this is after a hard day's work. It says, after he had sent them away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. So this isn't being pushed to some horrible challenge. This is him 
of his own doing, after a crazy day work, realizing I'm depleted. I'm really spent. You know what I need that's going to reinvigorate me? The wilderness. And it wasn't just mornings and nights either, because Luke's gospel tells us, Luke 5, verse 15 and 16. But the news about Jesus spread all the more, and great crowds came to hear him and to, and to be healed of their sicknesses. Yet he frequently withdrew to the wilderness to pray. So, you, so the idea is not that this is somehow some awful thing, but Jesus just endured it. This wasn't Jesus being forced to a place of weakness. This was Jesus being led to a place of strength. And what I'm saying is that the Spirit didn't lead Jesus into the wilderness so he could be tempted. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness because he was going to be tempted. The temptation's coming. This hard thing is coming. You have this whole huge ministry about to begin. You need to start it off with a full tank. I think Jesus overcoming the temptation wasn't made more difficult by his time in the wilderness. I think it was, made, it was possible because, because of his time in the wilderness. It was only possible to withstand all that was about to come because he was willing to first endure this time of being alone with the Father and fasting in a desolate place. I think we have to understand, this isn't torture for Jesus. This is a tactic for Jesus. This was strategy. Jesus is saying that, that if the devil's coming, if Lucifer himself is coming, he's going to show up. i got to be ready. So Jesus here is getting strong by being in the wilderness. Why? Because there he found quiet. We talked last week, if you missed the message, it was about how really central to this healthy soul thing is to be able to come to a place where we know how to calm and quiet our souls. Right? We live in a very loud world. We live in a world that's anything but calm, anything but quiet. Jim Collins said we live in a cacophonous age full of swarming insects, noise, and interruption, buzzing about emails, text messages, cable news, advertisements, cell phones, meetings, wireless web connections, social media posts. We run the risk of waking up at the end of the year having accomplished little of significance, each year slipping by in a flurry of activity pointing nowhere. It seems like somewhere along the way, we've developed an aversion to silence, doesn't it? We must be disciplined people who create the quiet space for disciplined thought and summon the strength for disciplined action. In the wilderness, Jesus had the strength to overcome temptation because he had created the space for the kind of thought and self-reflection and self-awareness. He was centered and anchored. He was energized. His soul was in a good rhythm, so he was ready for what would come next. So now, before we go any further, I, let's just acknowledge the times that we're living in. Let's acknowledge that we've made a bit of a mess. 20, 20, uh, 2007 is when it really all started to happen. 2007 is when the iPhone was invented. Steve Jobs held it up for the first time with his black turtleneck on. And now, all of recorded history is in our pocket. All of Wikipedia, every bit of knowledge there's ever been. The ability to have ceaseless communication and input coming at you all the time. And I'm not just even talking about the negative stuff. We talked last week about Netflix and Instagram, stuff like, stuff like that a little bit. But now let's talk about the positive stuff. The TED Talks, the the YouTube lectures, the college courses, podcasts. You could live a life where you are constantly, ceaselessly receiving good things, good inputs. And let's say you're not on Instagram and you're not on Netflix too much. You've kind of limited those things. But now it's just good stuff. It's just sermon podcasts. And there's this new, you know, this new worship album out. And you could, you could be having good input coming in all the time. And it's possible in a way it never was before in the history of the world to banish quiet from your existence. From the moment you wake up until the moment you fall asleep. And sometimes after you fall asleep. Just need a little TV noise to help me sleep. We have Bluetooth speakers in our shower now. That used to be a sacred time. It's never in the history of humanity been possible like it is now to have such incredible complex inputs coming in all the time. We never have to stop taking in if we don't want to. But the question is, with everything that's been added in the last decade, what have we given up? Because Jesus said it's possible to gain the whole world, but lose your soul. 
One translation says, you can lose touch with your very self. I also just read this in uh, Cal Newport's book, Digital Minimalism. He talks about how your brain, when receiving information like a TED Talk or like a podcast or uh, a book on Audible, it cannot disengage the social side of who you are. And so what happens is you're hearing somebody, somebody talk, but part of you, the social side of your brain, thinks it's a friend speaking to you. So you're taking in the content. But you feel like you're having a moment with someone. But let me tell you something. That person talking to you is in a little, little studio in Nashville, not in your car with you. You're not having a social moment in that experience. So the tragic side of that is you can feel fatigue and overload of the social side of you. So you're less likely to want to engage in actual face-to-face -face relationships because part of you is like, <clears throat> I already had so much time with people. But you haven't. And the tragedy is that those authors or podcasters are not coming to the hospital when your kid's in the, in the emergency room. They don't know your garage code and they're not going to be there if something happens. And so <clears throat> what are we giving up when we give up quiet? What are we giving up when we give up being just solitary? I love the quote from last week. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So I don't want 24 seven news coming into my head. I don't want nonstop audible coming into my head. I'm going to listen to some books and podcasts, but I'm going to find time in my life to make my own wilderness. My phone is going to go away. I'm putting that thing on airplane mode to be alone, to be still. There's, these are things we all need to do. 20, 24 seven prayers coming up in July. It is a perfect opportunity to get alone and get quiet. You can sign up at urfellowship.com to reserve private one hour time slots to pray at the upper room. Nobody else will be there. You by yourself alone. Another way to get alone and get quiet is to get outside. Go for walks. <clears throat> Tell Jesus got around. What is used all throughout the Bible as an analogy for a relationship with God? It's walking. Eugene Peterson said, The virtual elimination of walking by the automobile has more than physical consequences, for it also diminishes spiritual perceptions. We get places faster, but we experience less. We're going to have to make our own wilderness if we're going to learn to be quiet, learn to quiet our souls. I was thinking the other day that maybe our, our pace of life makes all the stuff we're learning about God a lot like skipping rocks across the pond. Never gets real deep, never gets down where it changes our lives, just skips across the surface of our soul and lands on the other side. There's this great story in 1 Kings 19. Uh, the prophet Elijah is really stressed out. And we know he's stressed out because he asks God to kill him. And so if you want to just crawl in bed for a little bit, that's one thing. But when you get to a place where you're, you say, well, like, God, will you kill me now? You're in a whole different place. So Elijah has to be killed by God. God doesn't kill him. He just says, come to the mouth of the cave, you're hiding again. So Elijah goes and the Bible says that this violent wind sent by God caused bits of the mountain to shear off. But the Bible is really clear to say that God was not in the wind. And then after the wind stopped, uh, there was this violent earthquake. And uh, the mountain began to shake. And although the scriptures are clear that God made the mountain shake, it's also clear that he did not speak to Elijah in the earthquake. And then after that, the Bible says that there's this, this raging fire, this inferno. And, and although it was spectacular, the scriptures are very clear that God did not speak to Elijah in the fire. And here's why I love the Bible. The next line says, and then a gentle breeze, or the still small voice. That's how we normally hear it. But Hebrew is such an interesting language. You see, in Hebrew, this, the same phrase, still small voice, can be translated as the word nothing. It can literally mean, and God spoke to Elijah in the nothing. So the wind stops blowing, the earth stops shaking, the fires die out, and then in the silence, Jesus speaks. And I'm wondering if that deep healing that we really are so hungry for isn't going to be found in one more successful meeting. Maybe it's not going to happen in one more sermon or one more book or podcast where the truths of the Bible skip across the surface and onto the other side and never make it into the deep end. 
Maybe the healing that so many of us are hungry for occurs when we take life out of fifth gear and slow it down. We need to stop and pray and quiet the soul and think and reflect and meditate and wrestle. Your life tells you where you are. This isn't complex. It's pretty simple. When was the last time you were in a solitary place? You have to ask yourself the question. When was the last time that you slowed things down and took a breath? When was the last time you were alone, just you and God? When was the last time you meditated on what our sacred scripture says? Let's end with this thought. I could have preached this whole sermon on Paul. Because before Paul ever preached anywhere, guess what? He also started in the wilderness. He did not go speak to people face to face. There was first a time of testing. Elijah I talked about, the mightiest of the Old Testament miracle working prophets. Not bad on a business card. And yet he had time in the wilderness fed by birds. Birds, every day, showed up with food for him. That wilderness time was responsible for the beautiful strength of character that was exhibited later on. I could have preached this whole sermon and used David as an illustration. He spent a decade in a cave where his, while his father-in-law hunted him. Best thing that ever happened to him. The wilderness years. Wilderness was responsible for him being the greatest psalmist of Israel, the poet warrior king. It was those days in the wilderness. That's why later on he was like, i got to get back to the wilderness. I could have preached this whole sermon using Moses as the backdrop. Years in the middle of nowhere. Until one day, he was present enough to see a bush on fire. When he was busy in Egypt, he might never have noticed the burning bush. But when he was in the wilderness, he was present and engaged enough. Walking around with sheep and nature alone being silent, that he heard God speak. I could have used John the Baptist. John the Baptist shows up preaching everywhere. Everybody, you know, everybody's coming out to hear him. Kings want to hear him. Poor people want to hear him. Roman soldiers want to hear him. Pharisees are mad at him, but they want to hear him too. And when they show up, he's like, who told you you could come, you snakes? Luke's gospel tells us, chapter 1, verse 80, John chose to live in the lonely wilderness until the day came when he was to be displayed publicly to Israel. God did it then, he does it now. When he wants to make a man, when he wants to make a woman, he makes them in the wilderness. You can't have a quiet soul without quiet time. So let's fight for quiet time in our lives. Lord Jesus, help us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.